You are listening to Season 2 of Future Ecologies. One day at the end of February, I decided to go float around in a canoe and watch clouds. I'm not very good at meditating, and this seemed more interesting than floating cross-legged above a cushion. This is all in aid of trying to calm my anxiety about the state of the world, climate change, and mass extinctions. I wanted to rest my eyes on nothing but gray expanses of fluffy clouds, the odd gull, and any natural creature that we had no claim of possession upon. The Romans, who seemed to claim everything, refer to that which, quote, belongs to all, unquote, as communia omnia, which also sounds like the perfect meditative chant. The day was calm, overcast, and mild. I pushed myself off, lay down in the canoe, and floated out to sea on a gently ebbing tide, to communia with the omnia. The beauty of bobbing along in the bottom of a canoe is that no one knows you're in there. Onlookers just see a piece of old fiberglass, which isn't good for salvage, or salvation for that matter. I had planned to float for the full ebb of a tide, six hours out, and then paddle home with the flood, feeling at one with the pull of the moon. After one hour, I'd exhausted the possibilities of Communi Omnia as both a concept and a chant. I had failed to spot even one glaucous wing gull, as all the seabirds were either obscured in the mist or bobbing around the canoe, waiting for the eagles to start a feeding frenzy on me. I was in the process of reconciling myself to not having what it takes to reach Nirvana, when there was a gentle rocking of the canoe. I assumed it was the wind picking up and felt relieved that I could now go home with a valid excuse of inclement weather. That was when I heard the first loud exhalation of breath, like a gunshot. It was a mixed pride of stellar and California sea lions punching through the water six meters off my bow. Sea lions this time of year are looking for herring and the salmon that chase herring. I was obviously intercepting the food chain. A stellar bull can weigh up to a thousand kilograms the California bulls are featherweights at 400 kilos, but they all have the same big appetites and teeth. The stellar winter along the coast before congregating in the spring at their rookeries or breeding grounds on islands off the north end of Vancouver Island and south of Haida Gwaii. The California started coming up the coast over the winter years ago, chasing the diminishing herring populations after the predations of automotive magnate Jimmy Pattison, who's had a monopoly on the herring and salmon fisheries. These southerners have been known to toss balls and algorithms on their noses, so I was hoping they weren't looking for some practice with my canoe. They quickly dispersed, and once again, I was adrift in the void. The only sound was the blood pumping around my body at five times the normal rate. According to the indomitable law of nature, where there is food, there are predators. And sea lions are themselves prey to transient pods of killer whales, known as Big's killer whale. Another fact that I can accurately relate is that from a supine position in a canoe, the two meter dorsal fin of a male killer whale is visible from four meters off the stern. Big's differ from the southern resident killer whales in a variety of ways, other than being vagrant. The most important difference is that they hunt sea mammals whereas the SRKWs are content to spend their days sharing Chinook salmon with their pod, if they can find one. The bigs don't vocalize like their cousins because they rely on stealth to hunt. It was too early for Chinook, so my company was unlikely to be members of the endangered J, K, and L pods that have charmed everybody around the Salish Sea. Everybody except the oil and pipeline companies and other predators. This possibility alarmed me somewhat from the bottom of my canoe. The Biggs killer whale's method of hunting is to dive down deep until they see the shadow of the sea lions above them, 
then race up at breakneck speed and stun the sea lions with their impact. In my nervous state, I dwelt upon the fact that the shadows of sea lions and canoes are not widely divergent. Suddenly another smaller dorsal fin hove into view and came straight for me. Two males were stationed on either side like sentinels, and the smaller female was approaching the canoe slowly. By her side I could make out the small form of a baby close up beside her. About three meters off the stern they sounded and glided under the canoe so that I had a full view of them. Her dorsal fin grazed the hull and I found myself on my knees for the second time that day. I didn't wait for the tide to turn. I paddled home very rapidly in case the heavens were also going to lay on a breaching humpback whale, since they too have returned to the sailor sea. The truth is, my depression lifted, because there is still some communia omnium living in the sailor sea for the time being. That's beloved author, activist, and naturalist, Bryony Penn, reading a story from her recently reissued classic, A Year on the Wild Side. Her peaceful boat rest was less seasick than mine. And this is my friend and one of our associate producers for season two, Fern Yip. Hi, Fern. Hi there, Adam. And you, you actually kayaked over here from Salt Spring Island this morning. I did paddle over um, on the Trichomelon Channel. Fern is sitting in for Mendel today in the studio with me to interrogate the idea of the naturalist. What does it even mean? And what to make of this strange breed? All right, I didn't sign up for interrogation or breeding, <laughs> but I am happy to chat. Broadcasting from the unceded, shared, and asserted territories of the Penelicut, Hulwitsum, and other Halkomenum speaking peoples, this is Future Ecologies, where your hosts, Adam Huggins and Mendel Skulski, and our wonderful associate producers, explore the shape of our world through ecology, design, and sound. A few months ago, Fern and I met Bryony at her cozy home on Salt Spring Island in the Salish Sea to talk about not one, but two biographies. We may as well call them life histories. Two life histories that she's recently published on two seemingly very different human beings. And um, to find out, since uh, Future Ecologies is secretly a self-improvement podcast, at least for me, don't tell Mendel. You are on radio, you know. To find out just how she manages to do all this writing and naturalizing, and still get her boots wet. Well, you've kind of raised a well-kept secret of mine, which is I say I'm busy to a lot of people, but actually, I'm not. I just go get in my boat and go. I I spend a lot of time in my rowboat. You can see all my oars. I'm like... I'm I'm the only person that has four pairs of oars. I was going to say, one side of your house is oars, the other side is gumboots. Yeah, (laughs) so you can tell where I spend my time. And I just tell people I'm really busy, and they all think I'm doing something productive, but I'm not. Um, But then I guess you could question what productive is defined as in our society. Being around Bryony makes me question my own definition of productivity and the manic pace at which I sometimes live. Still, she's actually written a lot in these past few years about these two, you might call them, naturalists. So I had this incredible privilege of interviewing two older men for the purposes of writing their biographies. And they couldn't have been more different and more similar. The first is the Canadian zoologist and conservationist Ian McTaggart Cowan. And the second, Hanaxiala Elder Wahed, or Cecil Paul. And it was in documenting and considering the lives of these two men that Bryony started to drill down into the idea of the naturalist. So when I was trying to come up with the definition of naturalist, I thought, well, let's go back to the source. Some of the elderly naturalists, 
um, and one of them was Bob Whedon. And Bob Whedon was a student of Ian McTaggart Cowan's. And he and Cowan and a whole lineage before him, dating all the way back to sort of Darwin's time, define themselves as naturalist, and this is how he, he described it to me. The naturalist comes into the natural environment with everything open. The naturalist doesn't leave anything behind. Scientist goes there with a job to do, which is to reveal truths that in the scientific sense can be proved. The scientist is supposed to leave his self behind and only engage that part of the mind that is a computer. Whereas the naturalist is open to a spiritual dimension, is open to being emotionally moved and can say so, and is open to being reminded of the metaphors that are all around us in nature of the non-human world and this veneer of artifact that we live in. So it's kind of an interesting fact that you, you raise the idea of spiritual and scientific in the same breath, because for most scientists that would be the death knell on their career, which is why in the, the book on McTaggart Cowan, um, a, a great part of it was looking at the secret society that formed of these scientists who were also spiritual men. They knew that they had a strong emotional attachment and indeed a spiritual attachment to the natural world. And for many of them, having gone through World War I and, and various traumas like losing their fathers or you know, depression or whatever traumas they had gone through, um, they found that the spiritual dimension of nature is what healed them. They were able to deal with their post-traumatic stress disorders by being out in the natural world. They weren't about to say that to their bosses or the, the scientific institute that they worked for, or you know, and sometimes not even their their wives or or you know, companions or friends. Okay, Adam, I have a bit of a confession to make. I was outside in nature quite a lot this summer. With your oars and gumboots? No, with my ropes and harnesses. Of course. Okay, so the confession is I didn't get around to reading the real thing. I mean, it's like over 500 or 700 pages. Uh Uh-huh. You weren't able to get through that behemoth that is uh, Bryony's biography of Ian McTaggart Cowan? Yeah, I mean, no, I didn't. But can you give me the Sparknotes version? Who was Ian McTaggart Cowan? Sure, yeah. Um, So... Ian McTaggart Cowan is often called the father of Canadian ecology. And if you're looking back at the history of conservation and biology in Canada, he's at the center of so many important moments. His teachers and eventually his students basically read like a who's who of the biological community. Like the the human biological, the, the biologist community. He, in fact, hired David Suzuki. So when you look at his lineage, there's just virtually no environmentalist in, in Canada that doesn't trace his lineage to Ian McTaggart Cowan, and Ian McTaggart Cowan traced his lineage through early scientists in Canada and then back into Britain. He's pretty much like the David Attenborough of Canada. Exactly. He actually had his own TV series, The Web of Life, which was sort of like the planet Earth of its day, if planet Earth was shot in black and white and included long, awkward shots of David Attenborough in a suit, sitting at a desk, talking very slowly. Hosts of small living creatures darting about, and this weird beast is the young stage of a water beetle. I guess the tension spans were pretty different in those days. All right, so what's the rest of the Sparks notes? Right, um, so I learned a whole bunch of things. Um, For one, Cowan was a lifelong hunter from a very young age, largely for his subsistence purposes, but also for science. Basically, back in the day, you would just go out and collect animals. By, by shooting as many animals by as possible. By shooting as many animals as possible. <laughs> but he also shot animals, but each one in a way, like... Maybe a different... Pro- <laughs> it was a different process. Different purpose. <laughs> different. Well, I was just thinking to myself, uh, reading that, you know, a hundred years ago, I would have been shooting these things. You would have been. And you would have been up close, and you would have known these animals so intimately. You could have told... The difference of a fur of a small mammal blindfolded, which is what Cowan could do. He could tell, oh, that's a muskrat. And here we have the world of the muskrat. No, that one's a long-tailed vole. That one, like he could tell the mammals from, from feeling them. 
Well, that's not what's in my field guide these days. Mostly, we just look at pictures. Yeah, except for entomologists. They actually still kill lots of bugs to do their work. But I can't talk because I kill loads of plants all the time. But you grow more. That's right. Two sides of the same coin. (laughs) Which I guess is the point I'm trying to make. He wasn't just a scientist or an educator or a statesman. He was a hunter and a lover of nature with a physical and a spiritual, not to mention a visceral and gastronomical connection with the more than human world. Today, to a certain extent, and especially back in the day, it was really dangerous for a scientist to express any personal connection with nature. You could lose your credibility, your objectivity, or worse, your career. And this is the most remarkable thing that Bryony's research uncovered. What's that? Cowan was part of a secret society called the Bee. Okay, so what is the Bee? The Bee is short for the Brotherhood of the Venery. Right, okay, like venison. Right, which actually used to refer to many different kinds of meat and now has only recently become um, the name for deer meat. Or a uh, venereal disease. Definitely a different route. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, Bryony discovered the existence of the bee in a set of files that Cowan left behind when he passed away, in a folder labeled... The Bee. Exactly. It's been around for almost 100 years, but until Bryony found this folder, nobody knew about it. It was started in 1926, so it's nearly 100 years old, the organization. It's a secret society, so we don't know where. Uh-huh. <laughs> Can we set the scene at all? Are they are they are they in this uh, parlor somewhere smoking cigars or, or? Yeah, the scene is that they would meet once a year. They would meet at wildlife conferences where they were going anyway as scientists, and then they would rent a room somewhere and they would always do it around winter solstice. And they would sit down and one of them would read an essay that they'd prepared especially for the occasion. Okay, who were the they? Um, the the sort of fathers of ecology and conservation, like Aldo Leopold and, and McTaggart Cowan and people like that, they were all in this secret brotherhood. So Aldo Leopold's Sand County Almanac book, which was published after he died, was a collection of the essays he had prepared for the brotherhood, for the bee. Aldo Leopold? Aldo f***ing Leopold. And so many other really important scientists of their era which are names that I didn't even recognize and most people probably wouldn't. People like George Bird Grinnell and Gilbert Peterson. But could you imagine hearing an essay from a Sand County Almanac read aloud for the first time in confidence? So why secret society? What do these men have to hide? It's not so much what they had to hide, but what they had to lose. As scientists with positions of influence in governments or institutes on both sides of the border, They felt they wouldn't be able to do their work and have any influence if they didn't appear to be completely objective. Major air quotes around that one. You know, scientists were bending over backwards to meet some kind of objectivity in the face of a of a political force, say a populist political force, that doesn't value objectivity, in fact. That sounds eerily familiar. Yeah. This crazy double standard where scientists are supposed to be objective, disinterested, and meanwhile, they're basically sitting ducks for political forces around them that are anything but. And always the power structure is that whoever wants to get resources to the market and objects to anybody standing in the way is going to try and discredit the scientists who are trying to provide sober thought about what that means, whether it's extracting timber, extracting minerals, or playing around with Mother Nature just one bit too much. You'd have to show me the scientists because they have a very big political agenda. Canadian campaigners call it a, quote, war on science, a slow and systematic unraveling of environmental and climate research budgets under the Conservative government of Stephen Harper. So basically, these men had to meet in secret to express their deep love of nature and their spiritual connection and their writing and their grief because they just couldn't do that out in the open. They couldn't provide their political enemies with any ammunition to somehow discredit them or or push them aside. So while Cowan was in many ways the classical definition of a naturalist in the tradition of Darwin and Aldo Leopold and and John Muir, he, he couldn't show it. And that's why the bee was a complete secret 
until Bryony happened upon that file just a few years ago. Wow, that's amazing how that story is reminiscent of what's happening today, 100 years later, with the March for Science and the muzzling of scientists. Harper administration, the Trump administration. I'm not so sure, though, that this adherence to some sort of notion of objectivity is actually a good strategy anymore. Yeah. Which brings us to Cecil Paul. So that was one world that I was immersed in for three years. And then I went straight from that to working on the biography of a man called Cecil Paul, who is still alive. He's nearly 90, just a few years behind Ian. Same, they all grew up through this turbulent 20th century. While Ian was working within the academy and within government and with his students in his TV series to affect change from inside the system, his contemporary Cecil Paul was very much on the outside. Cecil is the subject of Bryony's latest biography, which is entitled Stories from the Magic Canoe of Wahed. Which I actually did read. Can I take this one? Go right ahead. All right. So the first thing you notice about this book when it's sitting next to the book about Callan is that... Uh, It's about a tenth of the size. And it's full of stories that Bryony has recorded as Wahid delivered them orally. Right. Whereas the real thing is super detail-oriented and has all of this documentation from Cowan's journals of, of people and places and organisms in, in Cowan's life. Stories from the Magic Canoe, it's all oral history, and it boils the complication of a lifetime down to the elegant complexity of stories. Cecil Paul's story begins in the Kitlo. Cecil Paul was raised in the Kitlope, which is south and east of of Kitimat in British Columbia, in a very, very, very remote area. Um, And he was a Hanaksiala, member of the Hanaksiala First Nation. And this is an area that is incredibly beautiful, high mountainous, big raging rivers, It's the largest temperate rainforest that's unlogged on the planet. And this is the environment in which he was born, and he then was subjected to virtually every kind of form of colonization uh, and cultural genocide, where that entire nation went from, you know, thousands to 30 members. Um, So out of that tradition, he then went on to become a major leader in the environmental movement, that was coming from an indigenous kind of worldview. There are so many incredible stories in the book from Cecil Paul's life, but one of the most remarkable is how his family managed to keep him out of residential schools for over a decade. He was lucky to have been hidden for 10 years, and he was raised by his grandfather because his, his father had died of tuberculosis. He, his grandfather really was from a tradition that we can hardly even imagine now. And this relationship is really critical because eventually he is found and extracted from his community and taken to residential school, which really defines the next few decades of his life, where he works in extractive industry and struggles with alcohol and racism. Which, which in his stories he refers to as, as arrows, right? Yes, but he maintains this deep connection to the Kitlope, the place where he was born and where he was hidden from the state. And he tells this really poignant story about these survey markers he finds on ancient cedar trees near his birthplace. Which, because he's worked in forestry, he knows means they're slated to be logged. And this starts him on this incredible journey back to his roots and also towards leadership of a movement to protect the Kitlope, which he ultimately succeeds in doing by getting enough people to board his magic canoe and paddle together. And Cecil Paul, everything in his life is metaphor. He used metaphor, and he uses metaphor in order to cope with all the, you know, as he calls them, the arrows that have been thrown at him. But his most powerful metaphor, I think, is, is the magic canoe. So his concept is that we're, we're in trouble. And, and if you're a Hanaxial, a person, you can get into trouble very quickly because you're in a big country with big floods, big river systems big avalanches, big landslides, big snowfall, big everything, big trees, 
big runs. You have to know, you have to be prepared for, for change, chaos, and big events. And so their metaphor was that when, when you're in trouble, you just get everybody in the canoe, everybody has a role, and then you paddle, and you paddle in the same direction. And so his book is called Stories from the Magic Canoe of Wahed because he feels that climate change is the biggest challenge now and that we have all got to get into the canoe and we got to paddle in the same direction. And, and, and in that canoe, you can have very many roles. And it has roles like the Dalai Li Lai Yu, which is this person that sits right up at the front and spots what's going on ahead, because sometimes there might be a hidden rock, sometimes there could be a, a little treacherous whirlpool. That Dalai Li Lai Yu is not the person that's paddling in the back. He's not the, you know, sort of more Western notion of a captain. It's the person that's sitting up front and, and calling treacherous things that are coming up ahead. And I'd say that that's the naturalist now. It would have been the shaman then. It was, it's that role of sitting up at the front and identifying problems coming up. And that's, that's the role that Cecil Paul has been doing. And that is the role that, that Ian McTaggart Cowan did. Ian McTaggart Cowan was calling climate change in 1951. Holy smokes. Yeah. And Cowan and Cecil Paul are in that canoe together for a brief moment in time when they try to prevent the construction of the first Kamano hydroelectric dam. Well, the two men joined over this issue, not, not physically, but they were both working on trying to stop this huge hydroelectric dam that went in in the early 1950s. In 1952, the Kenny Dam was the largest sloping clay core rock fill dam in the world. A huge 230 kilometer long horseshoe shaped reservoir was created and a tunnel blasted through Mount Dubose to deliver water to a power generating station in Kamano, 80 kilometers from Kitimat. But the Kenny Dam meant flooding thousands of hectares of prime forest and agricultural land. The Cheslata First Nation was given one week to move out and lost homes, livelihood, and their dead. This was, you know, billions of dollars at a time when you didn't have these kind of mega projects at that scale. It's probably one of the largest projects in North America. And Ian McTaggart Cowan had tried to stop it through Western science. He was saying this is a huge project. It's going to have huge impacts on the salmon fisheries of not only the Fraser because of the Nachaco and then also on the other side with the Kimano River. Meanwhile, Cecil Paul was the one saying you can't bring in all these hydroelectric dams without having profound impacts on fish populations. Because he would watch things like the, the little oolican fish which are these little, sometimes they're called candlefish because they're full of omega-3 oils. And they were the staple of his, his diet in the, in the, the Hanaxi Island diet. And today we're always talking about omega-3 oils, you know, as if we've invented this notion. Well, no, you know, these, <laughs> these little fish have been the source of wealth and health for thousands of years. So here are these two men both fighting this issue unbeknownst to one another and coming from very, very, very different perspectives. Ian had access to every, every door would open for him because he was a very esteemed scientist. He brought the data. He could walk into politicians' offices and, and, and they would listen to him somewhat and they tried to moderate, you know, what they were doing. Meanwhile, you have a person that has been sent to residential school and not even learned how to read and write, but he's got the benefit of having lived this environment and survived on the, the oils of the Ulican, arguing against it from a very heartfelt way. And that's how I first met him. Um, this is Cecil Paul. Was he had come down to Victoria to give a talk about the impact of the Kamano project on his territory. He was the hereditary chief of that particular watershed, the Kamano. So um, both stories, I realized that I got, I sort of went into the lives of these men and there was so many similarities. I mean, there's nothing similar in terms of their upbringing, their privilege, their, their access to, to power bases, their education, nothing. One has a 
you know, a, one of the, the most celebrated scientists in Canada, and the other has, doesn't even have a grade two education. Um, yet they were both amazing naturalists. I think there was a whole lot of things that really it raised for me about the role of naturalists, that n being a naturalist is not, not confined to one culture. It's a, it's a human condition, these, these people that observe and, and inform and educate and have, have very high coordination of, of heart and mind. That's a, that's a beautiful observation that she makes, that the tradition of the naturalist in some ways eclipses culture and, and time and, and history. It is. And while Cowan and Cecil Paul weren't able to prevent the construction of the first Kamano Dam, Cecil Paul was successful in preventing the second. I, I actually recently visited the Nechako Reservoir, which is created by the Kamano Dam that was built in the 50s. and. It just so happens to be flooding 910 square kilometers of the critical winter habitat of the Tweedsmere herd of mountain caribou, in addition to all the downstream effects that it has on fish and other species, of course. Another damn tragedy. <laughs> oh my God, and you were telling me that we had a lot of bad puns in the podcast. <laughs> Don't put that one in. <laughs> that one is all on you, Fern. So, um... Is that it? Are we done here? No, we're not actually done here. No? We're not done with this topic. I do really appreciate the beautiful and elegant illustration that Briny provides in all of her research of those two men and what a naturalist is. But there's more to it than that. There's more to being a naturalist than just being the spotter at the front of the canoe. All right, so um, Fern, who who are you? Who oh, I'm a bipedal <laughs> from the planet Earth. <laughs> why why uh, why are you here in this room talking to me? Well, I live next door, so I you know live a You're paddle on the next away. Next island over. <laughs> That's right, the next island over. Which is where Briny lives as well, Salt Spring Island. It is. We're all connected through these Salish seas. I'm, what I've been doing for the last couple of years is really trying to get to the bottom of a super simple question, which is how do we reconnect people with nature? We come from inheriting a human story of disconnection, that of being disconnected from ourselves, other people like community and the greater world, the earth. Reconnection work is to change that story to one where we are rewoven into the web of life. It's interesting that you say story. What did you feel was missing from the stories that Bryony was telling? What do you want to add to that definition of the naturalist? Bryony uses two examples of what I would consider outstanding humans. People... You know, Ian and Cecil Paul lived larger than life lives and they left impacts that were equal to that too. But the story of a naturalist or being a naturalist doesn't just belong to the exceptional. It's a story that belongs to everyone. And I wanted to dive deeper into that idea and see if it had any substance. So I have been interviewing some people who are deeply involved with nature connection work and who in a way are training the next generation of naturalists. Yeah, and it's not just happening in the academy or even necessarily on the trap line. It's, it's happening in this whole new context. Definitely. I mean, it's happening up in the trees. Are you interviewing people? 
people in a tree. I am interviewing people in a tree. Rather high, too. Yeah, it's a high interview. It's a high interview. You know the expression, you have friends in high places? Well, you have interviews um, in high places. I like interviews in high places. <laughs> <laughs> Fern, you've been spending some time with some little proto people, with some, with some um, young human, pre-humans, Adam, I don't <laughs> larval humans. They are still fully human. They're just a different size <laughs> and maybe a little bit different stage of development. But yes, I, um, I myself work with kids outside and I was also able to interview uh, quite a few kids who are engaging with the natural world in a really significant way. Yeah, introduce yourself, go ahead. Yeah, I'm Sahara. I've been at Wolf, the Wolf Kids Program. I think this is my third year, and I am 13, almost, in two weeks. Hmm. I'm Matilda, um, and then I've been at Wolf for like eight months, <laughs> nine months ish, and um, I'm 12. They're all part of this program called Wolf that's run by Wisdom of the Earth, a school on Salt Spring Island. Yeah. And what are we in right now? A tree. A giant cedar tree. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty incredible. We're like. Yeah, I love just like climbing trees off and the just, ground right now. I'm just like looking up at the like branches. You both seem pretty comfortable in this tree. Yeah. <laughs> and just being outside. Was that always the case for I, either of you? I didn't climb a tree until like, I know, maybe like nine months ago. <laughs> That's so crazy. I know. Well, and no, you talked about, you talk about a sit spot too as being this important practice. And a lot of the kids mention the sit spot. Right. Yeah. What, what, is, what is a sit spot? The sit spot is a routine that allows people to connect with place on a, in a deep way. What does this sit spot mean to either of you? It's sort of, I wouldn't call it like meditation, but it's like, it's sort of, it's like just sitting and like stepping back, I guess, from your life and just like observing everything else's life, which is pretty cool. And we usually do it for like maybe 15 minutes at Wolf, but like, I've heard of people who do it for like seven hours. <laughs> is it the same place all the time? Is this place um, outside? Or? Yeah, it's outside. Um, I don't know, a lot of people's sit spots are in a tree, so that's pretty cool. Mine is on the ground, but near a tree, so that's pretty cool. And um, we really get to like know that place, and um, like as the year progresses, you'll see that like the animals there like get used to you, and so they, you know, like I saw a woodpecker, I was sitting at my sit spot, and a woodpecker just sort of like came up, like, super close to my face and just started like moving up a tree and I was like whoa that's so cool <laughs> so yeah one time I think this was two years ago my first year at wolf a brown creeper landed on my arm for just a second but it was still really cool so in your conversations with these with these kids like what does it mean what does it mean to them to be a naturalist why are they there why are they doing what they're doing how do they value what they're learning well, it's best to ask the kids those questions. Right. Do you feel like you <coughs> notice more things out now when you're outside now? You've been in Oh Wolf yeah, definitely. Years. Yeah, one hundred percent all the way, yeah. What's the difference? What's the change? I mean I guess I like can I know I have so much more knowledge. Like when I hear a bird I'm like, Oh, it's this bird or either I say that or I'm like I want to know what this bird is, but before I'd just be like, oh, it's a bird. Okay, that's cool. And like the trees and everything is like that and plants. And Do your friends outside of Wolf have that understanding or do you notice a difference if you have hanging out with friends outside of Wolf? Yeah, I think I can tell that they're just like not as connected and have not as much knowledge about that kind of thing and just like hanging out with them outside can really bring that out and I can see that for sure. Do you think this kind of knowledge is important even? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Why is that? 
Um, I don't know. <laughs> I guess because just to be able to like help yourself and if something happens, like, I don't know, just like to be able to connect with the natural world is really cool. And like, you know, to be able to, like Sahara said, um, be like, oh, this tree is a uh, red cedar and that tree is a dug fir. And like, you know, oh, that bird's, um, I don't know, a golden crown kinglet or whatever um, is pretty cool. Like, I don't know, a year ago, I'd be walking through a forest and I would just be like, oh, you know, trees and birds. And now I'm, I, like, there's so much diversity of like, you know, <laughs> different trees and different birds and like all the life in a forest is just mind blowing. These kids had such interesting answers to the, these questions. On the other hand, though, it's it's really hard to articulate sometimes. I think that's one of the things about naturalism. It's, it's hard to articulate to people who don't understand it or who haven't been raised like that, the importance of it. And then it's also sometimes hard to articulate even amongst ourselves. Like, like I call myself a naturalist before I call myself anything else. Um, and I don't necessarily know how to explain why. It just doesn't feel right to say biologist or artist or naturalist fits. But when you ask these kids, a lot of the times they're like, well, it's really nice to know the names of the birds, right? And that's, maybe that's like phase one naturalist is like birds are like the gateway drug for, for naturalism. I think that would actually be very true. Birds are <laughs> the gateway drug to naturalism. Um, I like how unique their songs are and how just like the different colors in their feathers and whatever. The term naturalist doesn't, is unfamiliar to them. It's it doesn't unique. necessarily resonate with them. Well, yeah, the kids, they don't really know what that term means. What does it mean to be a naturalist? I don't know. <laughs> like, do you see yourself as someone who might be a naturalist? No. Does that term even mean anything to you? Naturalist? Not really. Not really. Hmm. But if you ask them the things that they're learning and what they're excited about learning, suddenly they're telling you about all the different things that you can use with seaweed. Okay, what do you have? Can you? I believe we have bleached sea lurks and some Turkish towels. Why is this what like are so those weird? Things? Seaweeds. Oh, okay. The Turkish towel it like actually looks like a cow skin because some of it's bleached and some of it isn't. What do you know about these seaweeds? Not you? much. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm no I'm no seaweedologist, but. Oh, no, it's you eat them? The yeah. Oh, you, just ate, you just ate some. All yeah. of you are eating some right now. Yeah, it's, it's all, all seaweeds in BC, I, I believe, are edible. And the Turkish towel? Um, yeah. If you, you can use it as Turkish like... Turkish um, towel? You can use it as like... That um, feels weird. It's really <laughs> spiky and it feels nice. If you... Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's basically a towel. Yeah, it's if, a if towel. You, you could literally use it as a towel. It's a spiky towel. It's wet. It's a spiky if, towel. If you dried it. Why did you why did you collect these ones? Because we're gonna like dry them and yummy? eat them. Because we're we're doing a survival trip in the wool brand. Dude, for our year end for our year end trip, so we're gonna use it as uh, Can you just say your name and how old you are? Isaac and I'm age ten, as of yesterday. They have some intimate knowledge of land that they've been observing. Which based on I think what we explored with Bryony, that would qualify them as some kind of naturalist. No. <laughs> oh, I thought it was a pretty groovy rhythm. 
so yeah, whenever whenever you want to sh- introduce yourself. I'm Arno Gagné, and I'm the core instructor for the Wisdom of the Earth Immersion Program for adults. A nine month nine month journey into deep nature connection, mentoring, and culture repair. Hi, my name is Matt McKinney. I'm uh, one of the mentors at Wisdom of the Earth School. Uh, I've been doing H Shields Deep Nature Connection mentoring for about a decade. Uh, my name is Jean Claude Catry, and I come from France. And basically, I'm a village builder. I'm the director of uh, Wisdom of the Earth uh, Wilderness School that exists for the last 15 years, I suppose, 16 years. And what motivated me is uh, uh, the loss of, of my village when I was seven years old to move to a city. And that traumatism uh, is informing what I'm doing now, because basically what I'm doing is to regenerate village. <laughs> and so we started that school and we started to work with kids first. And, and, uh, and soon enough, we understood that if we wanted to bring kids through a journey of deep nature connection, we had to work with the parents, with them. And from there, uh, yeah, now these programs in, in our school for all village, uh, for all, <laughs> all, uh, all age. In, in your experience, what does it mean to be a naturalist? Uh, for, for me, there's a, a problem inherent to the word is that uh, the word naturalist uh, implies a, sp- a specialization in a bigger context of a society where other people are not naturalists. So w- my, co- my question is, uh, what other people are relating to if they are not naturalists? Like uh, in an indigenous culture, everybody has to be naturalists, have to know everything about the world, to know themselves and to be able just to survive there. And so the, the naturalist concept is born out of a society that lost contact with nature. And we created a specialty to, to remind us of that connection. I like to take it to some of my, my main teachers on this journey. The most more recent part of this journey have been of um, the Lakota people. And there's a word which is Ikche Wichasha, and it, it translates as the common man. To understand what it really means, you think about the common person 1,000 years ago, rather than the common person uh, today on, on a city street. Hmm. So that common person is connected to all things. They're connected to their family, to their ancestors, um, to all the different plants and um, animals and birds and they're connected to hundreds of species that they interact with and not just on a knowing their name and even their habitats and but they have a really close relationship of everyday interaction with these these more than human beings and so the other translation is the real people or which I would interpret as the natural people um, so the people that are who they are because they've built all these relationships with the natural world. Yeah, in the context of the work that I do, there's an idea that everyone is a naturalist and should be a naturalist. And nature is a, a pattern language, so that's kind of the primary way that our our brains and are, are, are formed or, or used to be formed now there's lots of other systems in place that you know our brains form on on different systems so a lot of what we're doing is facilitating structures through which that language of nature can be more primary in the development of young people and then for adults, how to repattern our brains on natural systems. So being a naturalist is kind of just about being human. I, I can totally see why these kids love being out there and doing what they do. I wish I had that as a kid. And so even a child that is five years old already have a lot of things missing. So I think it's true for all the kids that I've been mentoring at one point, they come to what we call the wall of grief. It's like now they have a choice, either they keep going in reconnection and they have to 
transform that and, and being willing to feel it, or they are going to avoid it. And in some way, uh, the whole modern society, the whole idea of progress is uh, a strategy to avoid the grief. And so we create solution to problem we imagine we created and we don't need to fix it. We just need to gr fully grieve it and to be able to transform it. Because behind that wound, there, there is a tremendous gift that can, can be offered to the world. I wish that I was put in those kinds of environments and given those kinds of, of teachings and had that less mediated relationship with nature. And I certainly want that if I ever have children. But at the same time, I think, you know, playing devil's advocate, it's like, when we think about developing young naturalists now, um, is it just something that those of us who have the privilege to do so can engage in because it's good for, it's good for us, it makes us feel good, it brings us closer to the natural world? But what, like, what larger societal good does it do? The, these nature studies aren't just about being able to name every single bird or to know the various medicinal uses of plants. The utilitarian aspects of this knowledge are important, but what is perhaps even more important is how our study of the natural world informs our human development, how it creates a different kind of human. And that's why when children are guided by the natural world at an early age, through different stages of development in their lifetime, it's going to help them become fully alive people. I think, I think you cut right to the, to the heart of it that there may be there may be utilitarian aspects to this maybe in a pinch if you don't you know if you need a light of fire you you know how and maybe in a pinch you know where to find food where other people won't or you know how to conduct yourself right in in the more than human world right um, and those are benefits tangible benefits both to uh, yourself and potentially to society but that's not necessarily the point the point is what kind of people we're making um, what kind of people we're making out of the proto-larval humans that, that I was talking about earlier. I, th I think my biggest concern, and you know, from the outside, and even myself sometimes, I think, is this just a lifestyle? Is this just one of many modern lifestyles that you can have that is more about your personal identity and who you are, how you are different from other people, than it is about actually getting us as a species to where we need to be to, to survive and thrive, right? There's always that risk that it's, it, or that fear for me that, oh, this is just another one of so many lifestyles that you can choose to kind of, you know, accessorize yourself as a human being, right? And yet I think that at the core of all of these like little lifestyles that you can try on when you explore them, there's an inner transformation that's very deep that can happen, that it is no longer a lifestyle but becomes a life way and a life way that can impact the way we humans are in the future. And that's when it, that's when it begins to actually have real substance and meaning. C can you give me an example? Okay, well like last year, I worked this program uh, in Anacortes, and I remember the first, the first week, all of these kids were like afraid to sit on the ground, you know, like it was kind of like, they had to like get their coats off and like wrap them up and like I had to kind of just like play games with them and 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 kind of joke and it like continually invite them to sit on the ground let them know it was fine to sit on the ground and they have to worry about getting dirty and I think by the fifth or sixth uh, session which was like one day a month just one Friday a month and by the sixth Friday, we were, you know, like all covered in mud, like racing down the trail to get back to the parking lot where the parents were going to pick them up. And there was this uh, rabbit that had its like limbs. It was like quartered by some like a coyote or a fox or something 
but its fur was just strewn across the trail and like the body parts were like strewn on each side of the trail in the bushes and the kids were like ravenously looking for all the body parts and I'm like like trying to usher them down the trail like come you know we got to get back because like we have five minutes to get you know whatever couple kilometers down this trail and the kids are just like besides themselves preoccupied looking for dead animal parts to try to put this story together of who killed this rabbit you know and so that's a very those are very different Pro- proto humans lar- larval very different larval humans <laughs> don't put that in there it's a terrible metaphor <laughs> I actually don't think it's a terrible metaphor at all. Like going from the, you know, the caterpillar to the, uh, the it's a lepidopteran metaphor <laughs> that I, I like. It's very much in keeping with the naturalist. Oh yeah. So, what now? Well, I I asked this question of both men that I was interviewing. The question of what to do. I remember asking. Ian this and he said well I've always been an an intentional optimist and that I've set my intentions as being optimistic because what else can we do so he always felt that there was three things that he needed to do one was to mentor the young Um, the other was to share information that was for him it was so important was the sharing of knowledge and, and the other one was to spend time, was to spend time out there. Spend time, enjoy it, share your knowledge, and, and mentor young people. Yeah, but how? He knew. He would say when I was teaching, if I started with, I don't know, copepods, none of my class would be with me. I'd see all these bored eyes and, you know, kind of shifting kids in the, because he taught in a first first year zoology. So he said, I always started with humans and I always started with sex. And I had them then. They were just like gripped. <laughs> and then, then I'd finish with the protozoa. And I think both of them would say that. The, the secret to both of them, because they were both great communicators, is start where people are and then take them on the journey with you. Well, what do you say, Fern? Shall we step into the magic canoe and be a part of a better story? I'd like to be part of a better story. <laughs> Me too! <laughs> Oh, let's be part of a better story together. (laughs) Thanks for listening. We highly recommend you read one of Bryony's books, A Year on the Wild Side, The Real Thing, or Stories from the Magic Canoe of Wahed. You can find them all at bryanypen.com. Also, for more about The Bee, check out The Bison and the Bee from CBC Ideas. And if you'd like to learn more about the Wisdom of the Earth School, check them out at wisdomoftheearth.ca. This episode of Future Ecologies was produced by myself, Adam Huggins, with help from Mendel Skolsky and Fern Yip. We'll be back next month on the second Wednesday Tell your close friends or anyone who you think might like what we do. Subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever podcasts can be found. It really helps us get the word out. In this episode, you heard Bryony Penn, Arnaud Gagné, Matt McKinney, Jean-Claude Catry, and Wolf Kids, Matilda, Sahara, Isaac, and Maya. Special thanks to Bryony Penn, Simone Miller, Tori Elliott at Touchwood Editions, the entire team at Wisdom of the Earth School, Ilana Fenaryov, the Access to Media Education Society, and the Wolf Kids. Music in this episode was produced by K Maths, Ballsy, Luke Garrigus, Claude Debussy, Leave, and Sunfish Moonlight. This has been an independent production of Future Ecologies. Our second season is supported by our generous patrons. If you'd like to help us make the show, you can support us on Patreon. Patrons get cool swag and an exclusive bonus mini-episode every month. 
This season, Mendel is taking us on a tour of Kingdom Fungi. To support us and get access, head to patreon.com slash futureecologies. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and iNaturalist. The handle is always Future Ecologies. You can find a full list of musical credits, show notes, and links on our website, futureecologies.net. Thanks again for listening. It is like a leathery grape. I'm gonna eat one. Okay. Mmm, it's got a big kick. Oh, these are funny. I could do this all afternoon. I want another. Oh, it's too squishy. Do you know anything about these? <laughs> I thought we weren't being educational. I wonder if the point of fruit is to get animals more fascinated by seeds. Maybe if there like... is a point of fruit, that 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 could be said to be the, the core of it. <laughs> the kernel. <laughs> the pit. <laughs> mm. That's my favorite thing about fruit. It's... Oh, there doesn't have to be a point. <laughs>